This is almost 200 years and multi-generations of Jesuits writing back. This had a deep influence on Europe, on the Enlightenment and so on, and of course a deep influence in, in China. But look at the openness with which they discussed each other's ideas. You don't have that openness today. As Europe has become uni universal in this thin liberal sense, it has become more provincial because it's more deluded, it's more pro preposterous and more isolated today than it has ever been in my lifetime. Thank you for saying this. And I am so yes. sad about it. I, I am European and I am so sad about this, about the enclosure of Europe in its own thing. Thank you for saying it. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm talking to two fantastic guests from two different Eurasian regions that we want to compare and discuss a little bit. I've got with me on the one hand, Dr. Ulrike Gero, who's one of Germany's most prominent non-conformist public intellectuals and university professors researching European politics. She's one of Germany's loudest voices against the endless escalation with Russia and for a pan-European reconciliation. She wrote many books and articles in favor of the European Union, but by now has taken a critical stance on the institution. To my other side, we've got John Peng, who's a senior research fellow at the Perak Academy, a think tank in Malaysia. He has served in policy and thought leadership in government, business and academia with a focus on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is ASEAN in short. He was also the founding CEO of the ASEAN Research Institute and of the Council of Southeast Asian Business Leaders. He's interested in the reframing of the discourse of international relations, especially as it applies to China and Southeast Asia toward the emergence of a multipolar world order. Both of you, welcome. Thank you. Very pleased to be here. <laughs> I really wanted yeah, to bring the two to of that. you together because um, of, of your respective backgrounds on the one hand and because you research these two institutions and the mm -hmm. dynamics around them. And maybe let's start with that one. Um, ASEAN and the European Union are different organizations. They work completely differently. Ulrike, what would you be most interested in learning about ASEAN from the ASEAN experience? And John, what would you want to know about the EU process now that you have an expert on that one in front of you. May I ask you, um, maybe first Ulrike and then John. Um, so again, very pleased to be here, Pascal, um, Mr. Pang. Uh, yes, uh, let's tackle this question. What do we learn from each other? I, I first would say there is basically no more ambition to learn from each other. Let me start with saying that I was in 2003 at uh, INSEAD Singapore and uh, worked with Douglas Weber, a professor of Singapore INSEAD, one of the most prestigious business schools in the area. And we had a program, what Franco-German tandem, inspiring the European integration, could do for ASEAN cooperation. Yeah. So there were clear methodical um, essays and attempts to compare the European Union to the Asian world and to structure the building of Asian countries around Franco-German tandem and the, the methods that the European Union applied post-war to get to what it is, which is this institutional body we have today, right? And interestingly enough, around the same time, I was many times in Latin America because in Brazil, we had the Mercosur. Uh, and uh, the Mercosur area was basically Latin America, trying also to, let's say, copy the European Union and thinking about a single market structure, thinking about a common currency, thinking about institutional government uh, that uh, basically corresponds to what the EU built in the 90s. Yeah, And so there were two regions in the East and in Latin America that had the idea we want to copy the European Union. But, I mean, to make this point very clear, the, these, this age is over, this time is over, yeah? Remember that we had two important books by the beginning of the millennium. The one was Mark Leonard, Why Europe Will Run the 21st Century. That was a breathtaking book um, appearing 2003 when the United States went to, into the Iraq war and everybody thought that the European Union would sort of pick up global leadership with rule of law, better governance and the whole thing. And we failed. And then there was the book of the American political scientist uh, Rifkin, Jeremy Rifkin, who wrote in 2004 the book um, 
how the European dream will eclipse the American dream. And that was a little bit the same fantasy. Now that the European, that the United States is in Iraq and will mess up the Middle East, basically what it did, uh, the European Union will sort of take over global leadership and it's the better, more organic, more democratic, more social global body to, to rule the world, to run the world. Yeah, That's 20 years ago. And that was the moment when we tried, I think, to model in Mercosur and in Asian countries uh, after the European Union. What did the European Union do? Rule of law, single market structures, common currency, uh, institutional uh, structures with common voting procedures and all of this. But 20 years ago, what we see is that the European Union is collapsing and we can detail this. 20 years after, we can see that most of the countries in the global south are totally disappointed about the promises that the EU hold and never fulfilled. And we can see that the whole momentum of the European Union in the in the world we are entering, the multipolar world with, uh, you know, the competition of big powers and so, that the European Union is nowhere. Nowhere between Europe and China, uh, nowhere in Africa, not stretching out to, to, to other global powers. So uh, I just wanted to start saying this. The, the real question is, does the EU still have something that other countries are striving for? And I try to answer no. And I think John can pick up on this one uh, quite well, please. Yes, certainly. Um, thank you, Ulrika, for, for starting that off uh, like that. Um, first, really, let me say how, how honored I am to be with you with you two this uh, this morning, at least in, out in my time. And uh, I'm calling in from Edinburgh of, of all, all places right now. So uh, on more on your side of the world, uh, Ulrika. But... Um, you know that that um, uh, trajectory that you mentioned from an uh, an EU that presented an alternative and and was in some respects an exemplar a a, a template for what it meant to um, to do multilateralism uh, or a kind of regionalism mm -hmm. um, to where it is today is that's a really puzzling and. Um, instructive or perhaps a potentially instructive kind of uh, trajectory. Let me say that, you know, it's exactly that time period over which I, I, I you know, I think about this from my own experience. So I started working um, it, uh, at, at one time in, in Malaysian government um, and then later on in uh, sort of ASEAN regional activity, uh, community building, uh, ASEAN's community building, ASEAN's kind of regional activities. And um, when I started up that um, sort of ASEAN Research Institute uh, in particular, but even before that, um, I had frequent interaction with uh, EU officials, you know, there, but also um, on, on trips to, to, to Europe. And um, it seemed at the time that uh, there were two things going on. One, there was always a certain expectation or a, 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 a larger narrative on which, or a meta narrative on which organizations such as ASEAN uh, would one day become more, so have more um, structure to them, more institutional form. You know, if you if you behave yourself and you you will, and if you do things right, you when you grow up one day, you'll be the EU. Yeah, so, uh, so <laughs> that's what that I was the, saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so you know, if if you if you're good, you you take your cereals, you'll be the EU one day, and um, so that was a framework with which to judge ASEAN and. Uh, its lack of uh, this sort of infranational um, in institutions. Why couldn't ASEAN do anything? So ASEAN was always, at least in Western terms, defined against that. Uh, and, and we in ASEAN were always pushing back against that. We're something else, but it wasn't as clear as it is now that we are something else. Um, and, uh, and, and no longer need to be defined as the thing that is not, not EU. Uh, moreover, doesn't want to be like EU or could never be the EU. And is <clears throat> we are not dysfunctional uh, because we're not like the EU. In fact, the, the only reason why we're still around and remain relevant is that we are not that. But um, to respond to Pascal's question, uh, what, I'm, what am I curious about, about the EU is how did we get to this place <laughs> from where it began, yeah. you know? Um, from from these grand dreams, and and again, it's this is biographical. There was a time 
when I think people like myself valued it, valued the EU as an alternative yeah, within the West, as an alternative path, very, very sympathetic to its post-war uh, Pacific type of um, uh, um, uh, intentions, right? The, uh, you know, it is to prevent the horrors of, of war from happening again. And also it was a kind of move against, to, to ameliorate some of the, uh, you know, the, the very clear excesses and the issues with just uh, nationalism, with the nation state system of, of Europe. So it seemed to be that grand kind of experiment and indeed, of course, and we could see exactly during the Iraq war and so on, it, you know, they didn't always toe the U.S. line, that it represented this other uh, um, other path. And, and, and it was multilateral in a way that the U.S., you know, uh, was not. Uh, what it is now is something probably worse than, than nothing. I think it's becoming almost an, an annex of um, the West as defined by, the, the, by, by U.S. policy. And uh, and against and defined by NATO, so almost becoming dominated by by NATO. So to put it succinctly, you know, how do we get from 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 all that to um, you know to um, to von der Leyen from <laughs> Adenauer I mean, to yeah. von der Leyen? How do we get from Adenauer to von der Leyen? <laughs> and and it seems to be against everything that one understood the EU was meant to 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 represent. Yeah. Yeah. Look, um, the most fantastic question uh, we can discuss, and probably we will need more than one hour, and we should basically make a <laughs> out of it. Yeah, to make a long story short, uh, I do not want to do self advertising, but that's the book uh, Endgame Europe: um, How the EU Basically Lost Its Dreams for the Last Thirty Years, and the book yeah. tries to recapture. Uh, the time between 1992, Maastricht Treaty, all the political ambitions, building a peace order with Russia, building political Europe, Maastricht Treaty in 92. That was the big moment. And then the book has basically three chapters, the 90s, the years zero, so 2000 to 2010, and then the last decade, so three decades, yeah. And in essence, if you um, want an answer to your question, how do we how do we get there? I think this is for Europeans. The most important question we need to pose of ourselves. I mean, imagine we are a very wealthy continent with very good universities, with very good staff, energies, industries, whatsoever, architecture, the arts, yeah? And we screwed it up. In 30 years of ambitions to uh, basically make a democracy, a European democracy, make a constitution, make citizens prosper, welfare, whatever, we started like um, like this, and then we failed since basically 20 years. I mean, the, the constitution failed in 2003, then came the banking crisis in 2013, then Ukraine war, Corona, I mean, a whole destruction of European societies, plus populism, uh, many, many, many aspects, yeah? Um, and the question is a real one. What happened in Europe in the past 10, 20, 30 years, so that we lost our dreams and that we lost our capacity to act as a political, sovereign and emancipated body within the West. And I think, and that was your question, what we need to do, I mean, first is this analysis and I announced that next year in summer 25, I will publish a book on this because I, um, obviously as you, I have many memories about what happened. I worked for Jacques Delors in the 90s. Yeah, to take to take your point that you worked with Malaysian uh, authorities and you talked with the EU and you always talked about how the EU could model Asian countries. That were the times. I remember sitting in Singapore and everybody was discussing, okay, how can Asia do a single market? How can Asia do a currency? What should be the name of this currency? Yeah. And so on and so forth. Yeah, there was the EU template and the others were just trying to copy yeah. the template. And if you are grown up and adult, adult perhaps you could be as nice as the EU. That were the days. Yeah. And 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 within again 20 years, we totally failed. So for me, there are two interesting questions. Did we fail? Most of the time, answers are dialectical. Yeah. Did we fail of own incapacity, the Europeans, meaning we couldn't get together the constitution, we couldn't democratize the system, we had these populist tendencies, we whatever mismanagement, migration. I mean, there are many, many aspects why in the past two decades the European endeavor failed. Yeah. 
and or and or was it external intervention i mean the question is legitimate to ask whether say united nation united states interference uh, building the euro was a clear competition to the dollar building the european constitution would have strengthened the european union as political body was this if you are sitting in washington and you want the west united do you want within the west an antipode which is a european sort of antipode getting stronger you don't um, i worked for um, the german marshall fund i went washington back and forth i had endless discussions in my life in brookings institution and in all these uh, think tanks in the United States discussing this. What is the European entity, the political entity, the, the structured political entity within the West? Can it be a strong and um, uh, an emancipated entity? And the answer is no, we lost this discussion. We didn't do the constitution. We didn't go well through banking crisis. We didn't have political management when the banking crisis occurred 15 years ago, it was not about lazy Greeks. It was about missing political mm. management because we didn't have the European tax authority or um, fiscal authority that could have managed like the Fed, the United States, managed together with the fiscal authority. And then the US went quickly out of the banking crisis. Two years, they were done with it. And we in Europe, we hang around with a banking crisis with one euro 16 fiscal authorities and we couldn't manage yes. so it was always the fiscal the the political problem that we couldn't get through and um i think this is one uh prominent way to an answer to look at the what we call democratic deficit at the political flaws the political flaws of the system the problem that there's no sovereign body that can decide for the European Union because we never de defined what is the European Union. Is this a state? Is it sovereign? What are the citizens of the European Union? I mean, all these questions up to today are not defined. And there, uh, I remember it was the Peterson Institute in the banking crisis who had an article in 2012 or so, it's politics stupid. It wasn't even the economy because Europe has strong economies. It's politics and the missing political link. So I think that is one way of an answer why Europe basically failed as a political endeavor in the past uh, decades. And now it's sorry to say that uh, nobody wants to copy us any longer. I think we are thrown into different discussions. And the different discussion is the one that Pascal animates about neutrality and about a global multipolar world. And so I think the chance for the two of us, I mean, the two and others, uh, Mr. Pang, and others who want to uh, in, envisage this multipolar world is to shift our own discourses to that sort of thing, what is this multipolar world and which entities, which political entities are needed to build that multipolar world? Is it only about China and Russia and Iran and Brazil and South Africa? Or is it the multipolar world perhaps about political entities, Latin America political entity, Asian political entity, European political entity, but transcending the European Union? which as a model has failed. John, do you want to react directly? No, no, absolutely. In terms of this, this larger question of world order that, that you touched on and that really is um, it, it's, it's urgent now and, and animates this, this, this whole discussion. And from an ASEAN perspective, um, a strong and um, strategically autonomous Europe was always the great hope. And that would have been the, the much better way towards multipolarity. And it's now really dangerous, actually, and, and, and unfortunate that, that Europe is not going in that direction, to put it mildly, that it yeah, has and, yeah. identifies with a, a kind of the West, some notion of the West in, in this way, in this strange way, right? Yeah, it's, a, it, it's really a kind of a show of it. Great. Um, how Karitz is, uh, because I am um, the director and the, the founder and the director of the European Democracy Lab, which is a think tank. It's a very small think tank. It doesn't have much money, but we have a little structure thinking about 
Europe's place in the world. So we have two motto. The one is shaping Europe beyond the EU. So what about the institutional structure of the European Union beyond the EU? How, 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 how Europe could be politically structured beyond the EU? And the other is shaping Europe for a multipolar world. And my co-director, Hauke Ritz, just brought this book on the market. I know you don't read German, but it's basically um, the failure of the West, the downturn of the West, and the uh, reinvention of Europe. So what Hauke argues, Hauke Ritz, um, in this book is essentially, and this is, I think, one answer to your question. I think we agree on the analysis, and I'm very happy agreeing on the analysis. Um, but the thing is, we need to deconstruct the West. I mean, Pankaj yes. wrote that book years ago, The West is Finished, yeah? And the interesting question is, what is the West? And what Hauke does, Hauke is a philosopher, and he um, does uh, um, uh, basically um, history of political thought. And what he says is, there's no such thing than a West. Then, the, then, then culturally, the West, Europe and the United States are totally divided. And so the way to reinvent Europe comes through European culture, comes through European thinking and comes through things like what is sovereignty, what is the republic, what is communitas, what is uh, uh, societas, what is our cultural background that is not the cultural background of uh, Rockefeller, United States, money makes the world go round. I don't know what the European uh, uh, blockbuster uh, uh, California dreaming culture is. But there is a resonance of a European culture that has centuries of, you know, um, thinking the state, thinking the social, thinking the republic, thinking political communities. And what Hauke argues is, if we could, in order to build a multipolar world, distinguish culturally the United States and Europe, refine the European culture and rebuild Europe around its ancient cultural roots. Yeah, Then we have a way to a multipolar world with a strong Europe. And we will discuss, Pascal, the notion of a emancipated Europe like Macron, for instance, was framing it. Yeah, But going through that culture, and here's the thing, if we were to do this, Hauke's argument is that Europe is in strong resonance with Russia, with Indonesia, with Iran, with uh, China, in terms of cultural Racine um, roots. Why? Because Europe has a concept of the social, of communitas, of republic, res publica, of common goods. And so has the Oze, so have the Russians. So there is there is a resonance in the, in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. So if we were to refine as Europeans, to disconnect from the American sort of cultural overkill we, we got in the past 60 years, and we can find our culture, we could go in cultural resonance with the other powers in Europe. Eurasia, and then we could build a multipolar Europe. And you, you know, wow. you yeah. know, we are one landmass. We we tend to forget that, but you know, you exactly. you can walk. Google Maps, I kid you not, can give you turn by turn directions how to walk from Bangkok to Berlin. Turn by turn direction. It's one single landmass. Uh, so obviously something unites us. But uh, uh, John, do you want to react to this? I have one question that I want to ask after this. But first, John. No, absolutely. That that's that's wonderful. That's I you know very very resonant um, um, in in uh, in places with places outside outside of, of of Europe because one could go into to 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 go back to the question earlier about what happened to Europe. One could go into some of the technical issues and there are many and they're serious. For example, you know, trying to have this common currency without without fiscal um, union, and and maybe there were these these types of of, of blocks, and but there was always this lingering question. Um, and Ulrika, you you talked about it as this Europe defining itself, about whether the roots of this failure were were, were embedded were planted at the very beginning, um, in in trying to um, achieve this. Um, uh, uh, th th this this sort of Europe without that denser, richer retrieval of of, of culture um, and and of history um, about what what is what is Europe today. 
about what Europe inherits today. Because of course, as pa Pascal says, you know, you have different Europes for different times. It's uh, in some sense, the, 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 the notion of Europe or of the West that we operate with um, today is, a, is kind of a post-imperial, imperialist, post-colonial uh, one. You have an earlier uh, West, which encompassed the Mediterranean, right? Which would uh, include today what is parts of North Africa and Egypt and so on. But, you know, beyond that type of question, I would say that this, uh, what, what Ulrika described is, is, is something other people, you know, it's not just Russia, right? It's what China is trying to do and, and what in Southeast Asia as well, people are rediscovering. Um, to form that political community, you need these richer, historically, culturally embedded, even theologically embedded notions of your community, of your political society, that liberalism is, to put it bluntly, is not, not enough. That this, yeah, this, yeah. this political liberalism <laughs> of the United States, that, yeah. that's not going to do it. Yeah. And this I'm... notion of the common good, you know, Europe is, is uh, Europeans are entirely legible or, or visible to, to Asians and, and, and Chinese people uh, from a traditional perspective. W when you talk about that, you know, I, I, I wrote a little piece with, with, with uh, Adrian Vermeule, uh, the, uh, uh, the the great American jurist um, on this that that for example if the if the U S if, if U S intellectuals and and here we're talking about the U S not not Europe uh, or maybe Western intellectuals wanted to reestablish that dialogue with 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 Chinese intellectuals you have to go to the common good tradition of of the West that notion of the West that is that is that is classical um, that remains actually <laughs> the tradition of 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 China. Despite all the disruption, yeah. the, the post-enlightenment disruption of, of China, uh, what people fail to grasp is that it is continuous in a way that today's Europe is not with its own past. Yeah. Look, I mean, I'm very sorry for always picking books, but... Uh, um... Yeah, well, yeah, there's another book in there. That's great. Yeah, and 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 the, because you know, I mean, basically, that's the book I wrote in 2013. Why should <laughs> yeah. Europe should become a republic? Yeah, it's in English available, and uh, and here's the thing, you said liberalism is not enough, but what we did is framing all our political systems only on liberalism. Yeah, liberal right. democracy, la la la. And we are forgetting that what you want to be is a community. So people have a desire to be in a community and in a social community. Yeah. And that's the word of the Republic, res publica. And so if you go down, and I did this in this book, yeah, you start with Platon, Aristoteles, Cicero, Kant, Rousseau. So you have uh, 1800, uh, 18 centuries in which basically when you talk politics, you talk the Republic. You don't talk liberalism. Yeah. And that is, I think, this uh, distinctively different from what the United States did. I mean, by the way, they also, uh, uh, how to say, um, uh, uh, turned around in the wrong way because the the federal papers are basically Republican papers in in the 18th exactly. century. Too, yeah. So the, the Americans exactly. are also in trehesion of their own basically founding fathers, exactly. but um, the American constitution. And their constitution. Basically totally influenced by Europe, yeah? So it's the same sort of um, perversion of thought, yeah? But I think there is something very important to look for. And if you go down this route, <laughs> the more interesting thing is that if you say today Republican, yeah, it's nasty, it's right-wing, it's Trump, it's Marine Le Pen, Les Républicains, you know? So um, the, 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 the jewelry of our political wording, the social, la république, uh, the republic, is hijacked by basically populist parties. So that's in terms of thought philosophy, it's also a problem now that political parties hijack these notions, which were once upon the time the notions in which we... Um, did our political thinking, you know, for instance, it's not last sentence, but it's not trivial that the state names of European states are all republic. We are not Germany. 
I'm not living in Germany. I'm living in der Bundesrepublik Deutschland. It's not France. It's la République Française. It's not Italy. It's Republica d'Italiana. Resposch Polita Polska and so on so forth. Republik Österreich. Yeah? This is not trivial that the name of the country and, and it's only in, in the past decade when the European discussion were so uh, uh, how, you know, how to say, I mean, so Uh, uh, going down the going down intellectually that we started to uh, to talk about Germany and France and Austria that we dropped the Republic and the state names it's not trivial it's a time of the sign it's a sign of the time that basically um we are forgetting where we come from yeah and I think really there is um with especially with Chinese with uh, state, state policy and state art in China, uh, if you want to manage a huge territory like the Chinese, yeah, you need to have elements of um, um, of balancing, yeah, of, of, of state balancing, of social balancing. And I think that's what the Chinese does, what the Chinese do. Last sentence to terminate here. Uh, the, Europe, the, the United States basically dropped half of its population into pure poorness. You know, the, the ba basic income is fifty thousand dollars since 1970. It didn't increase. The middle, the middle in the United States is, is falling down. The China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. Yeah, so we say it's a dictatorship, and the U.S. is a democracy. But if you reason in terms of what is better for people, what is the outcome? China lifted 800 million people out of poverty and the US dropped 50% of their population into poorness. I mean, we should discuss these things. What is the goal of a state? Yeah, Is it a goal to have a liberal democracy that basically um, pushes people into poverty? Or is it the goal to have a state that does well in terms of res publica, well-being, um, public goods for their citizens? I mean, these are open questions. And I think Pascal allows us now to discuss it here, but even framing it that way is, I think, not so easy in these days in the Western world, because with all the supremacy and the arrogance and the uh, whatever we have in European discourses, we do not even allow these questions. And John, correct me if I'm wrong, but in ASEAN, this is actively discussed, right? This is actually on uh, on the table, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's it's discussed, and but but not always in the most um, so, you know conscious or uh, you know reflexively co conscious ways. Um, you're talking about the, these these uh, primary concepts. I think there is a strong sense that these things need to to um, that th there is more to the the state, the political community, than than just you know the the, the rules. Uh, than just what what John Rawls can 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 imagine, right? So it, there, there's more to it than that. And the way in which ASEAN is 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 organized, or or not organized, the way in which people associate with one another, I think embedded in that is some notion that there is 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 allowing space for people to express different political uh, if, political visions, different forms of of, of community. So, you know, I think it's 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 clearer to see this in in China. So now they talk about socialism with Chinese characteristics. You know, the Chinese characteristics part is not just adornment; it's not cosmetics. <laughs> it's it's deep and it's and it's and it's serious. So the continuity with earlier notions of political community and political society in China is being retrieved right now. It's there and 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 it's politically significant again in a, in a conscious way, um, and I think you know in Southeast Asia people are going to come to that. And so you know what Ulrika is talking about is is very very important, um, but you know one doesn't hear it enough from 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 European intellectuals. And I. I do have this yeah. question because yes, the philosophical um, background and so on matters a lot and where liberalism went wrong. But on the other hand, there are also very is a few very concrete concepts which these two entities approach completely differently. And I think the most mm -hmm. fundamental one is the question of sovereignty. The EU from the beginning was a project of supranationality, right? Give powers of the state up into the higher institution and do it little by little until you're the uh, United States of Europe, right? 
at the end, that was never the idea. And the the Europe, the EU in this kernel started as a Second World War, an outcome of the Second World War, right? Whereas ASEAN is the outcome of the Cold War bipolarity, but also of these states of Southeast Asia who said, let's work together, but not integrate. In the integration was never the idea. And ASEAN for the longest time, and even now, says we we cannot overcome this veto that everybody has. On the other hand, that is what keeps ASEAN together. And this, uh, I am very impressed by how ASEAN is managing the Myanmar crisis that, okay, Myanmar is suspended, but it's still part of the organization. I cannot imagine the EU having a similar approach toward a, a, such, um, a such a case if it happened in, in the EU. So can you maybe talk about that? And maybe at, later we get to NATO worth a Seattle, one who worked, one who failed. But maybe, okay, um, let's start with John, actually. Um, so so ASEAN uh, not is really ASEAN. not, it, it, it's not. Look, so, sovereignty in ASEAN, you, you have to understand, was achieved uh, in, in the teeth of uh, the struggle against colonialism. In the in the, it, you know, it's achievement, it's post-independence achievements of almost every state in, in, in ASEAN. So they're not going to let go of that. It's clear, and they weren't going to to to, um, to trade it uh, for that collective sovereignty that the EU was supposed to have. So there was the first and biggest hurdle in the work that people like myself and others were were, were trying to do in fostering ASEAN integration. The idea of a common market, for example, uh, and and you want to have a freer flow of goods and people, and then. Sovereignty seemed to be a problem and, a, and, and an issue. But at the same time, if you look at how ASEAN's diplomats, uh, at ASEAN statecraft on issues like Myanmar and earlier on Cambodia and so on, there is a, a lot of the way in which they operate is, 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 is cultural. It's political culture of, the, of a very long shared history. But people were not used to talking about it like that. They just called it the ASEAN way and so forth. This is not well theorized. Uh, ASEAN is not as theorized as Europe, you know, by, by far. But it doesn't mean that there isn't a very distinctive uh, political history and an intellectual history um, behind it. So this, this is a very, very interesting time for ASEAN, actually, uh, for the countries of Southeast Asia and for, for, for ASEAN. Um, as this is happening in, in Europe, uh, people like, like Ulrika realize this in Europe. Um, and as you see this, uh, again, this movement in, in, in China to rethink uh, many of the categories, uh, essentially European categories, categories from the European Enlightenment, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to look at their sufficiency for the project of um, the, the political community or, or, or the state. Ulrike, do you yeah. want to react? I'm sorry, but I need to get up to pick another book. But uh, we are addressing <laughs> this podcast to people who are smart intellectuals, and most of the time they want to read. Yeah, um, <laughs> the, so, Ulrike has uh, a book for everything. <laughs> yeah, but, it's really uh, impressive. Also, also when you talk with her, you know, I, I she can always everything. And this is also this is... an anti-digital statement. Please, people, do read books. Do read books, not yeah. only PDFs. Yeah. Uh, but that's the book. Now it's a French book, République ou l'Europe. Because uh, that's, and that's a book of 2003, in the midst of the European constitutional making, when the French, the best brains of France by then, had an in-depth reflection about what uh, Pang, Mr. Pang was just saying, the question of sovereignty in the midst of all these discussion, ASEAN sovereignty, do we integrate? And then the question is, what do you integrate? What can you integrate? You can integrate a market. You can say, okay, we do a key communitaire, you integrate goods, yeah? Then you said one market, one currency. It's silly to have one market, but several currencies. So you integrate a market and you merge uh, central states banks, yeah? Bundesbank, Banque de France, uh, Banca d'Italia. You did a merger and you created uh, the ECB. You cannot integrate citizens into one democracy because the citizens are the sovereign. Yeah, so you can integrate a market, you can integrate a currency, but you can't integrate citizens. You can unite citizens, but not integrate into what you integrate them because the citizens are the sovereign. So when you are talking about a democracy and you say, what's democracy? Democracy is that everybody applies to the same rules. You do not integrate citizens, 
but you found a republic because that's the notion of republic. That's why l'Europe ou République. Either you have republicans like uh, Republic d'Italia, like yeah. I said, and so on and so forth. And then in these republics, the citizens have the same rule of law because they're citizens of this republic and they uh, obey to the same rules. Or you have Europe, and that's an integrated structure where the money is integrated, the currency and the single market, but citizens are not united. And that is the flip side of the EU, that we couldn't unite the citizens of Europe in one democracy, whereas we integrated markets and goods. Yeah, that is the, the that is the 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 ultimate sin, if you want so. And um, I admire, or that's not a question of admire admiration. I think the Asian countries already 2003, when I was in INSEAD, they smelled it. They smelled that it doesn't work if you integrate the economic stuff, but you keep the citizens non-united because you do not build a state. I mean, actually, you're talk to, talking state building. That's why I wrote this book, why show Europe should become a republic. Because if you, you, you cannot trade sort of the, the integration that you do on the economic side with non-united citizens, because the citizens are then the only ones, the, the sovereigns, I mean, the sovereigns, the, the sovereign citizens are the only ones who are not united in the political body under the same law in the, in the political body of the European Union. And the Asian countries, as much as the Mercosur countries, quickly realize that it goes uh, to nothing, to nowhere, when you uh, abolish the national sovereignty and you merge and you integrate too much the economic and the social stuff, because then you lose control about the welfare of your citizens. And that is what happened to Europe. We we lost the, the control about the welfare of our citizens. Then we had the banking crisis, we did austerity, we did policies that were harmful to citizens, and then we got populism in reaction. Yeah. So um, I, I, I totally agree uh, with Mr. Pang, with John Pang, that um, the notion of sovereignty that we need to intellectually sort of um, nail down is what is the essential thing also for the multipolar world. Because then the discussion is we couldn't build a political and democratic European Union because we dismissed to define properly what is the question of sovereignty. You can also put it that way. You can say we didn't we didn't found a European state. You know, I was there. Were, there were books by then, twenty years ago, when we did the European Constitution. There were many books. I remember a French, very important book, La Question de l'État européen, the question of the European state. So twenty years ago, we were in a way um, more forward looking than today because at least we dared we dared to question: Shall we create a European state? We can say yes, we can say no, but at least we raise the question that if we want to think sovereignty in Europe to the end, we should create a European state. And if we do so, we should call this state European Republic because all states are called Republic, you know? So so that is, that is sort of the intellectual way. Now, that failed. We don't have that European entity. Macron has been endlessly talking in all his speeches at Sorbonne and all these important speeches in Athens about souveraineté européenne, souveraineté européenne. My point is, there is no such thing than European sovereignty if you don't have a political system in which the sovereignty is linked to the people. Because sovereignty to the outside world, sovereign being in power projection or sovereign to, to start a war or to, to make diplomacy. Yeah, I mean, you need a power prote projection if you want to be a player in the world. But you can have that so sovereignty, that is my point, only if you have a political system in the inside which links the sovereignty back to the people. And that is not the case in the European Union, because in the European Union, the sovereignty is linked back to 27 nation states who endlessly cannot decide yes. on one thing. And so there's no sovereignty in the inside. The citizens of Europe are out of the equation. There's no linkage between sovereignty, so-called sovereignty of the EU and the European citizens. And that is why the European Union cannot be at the time being, for the time being, part of a multipolar world and have a power projection because it didn't solve the question of sovereignty. And, and that's the interesting point because ASEAN never aspired to do that. And never. But 
ASEAN works economically and it's it's prospering and it by now is set up in a way that makes it more compatible with the multipolar world. John, maybe you can pick up on that. It's more compatible because it's part of the project of a multipolar world that began quite a while before the, the present. It, it began with all these dreams of um of, of independence. Mm. You know, in the in the in the forties and 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 fifties, um, as as these these post independent states were formed, uh, you recall, and we're near the seventieth anniversary of the Bandung Conference, that brought you know what is the the, the global South together, Africa African and uh, at least Afro Asian. Uh, this this meeting for Afro Asian solidarity. So the principles elucidated there and thereafter in the non aligned movement, and then also in ASEAN. These are the principles of coexistence, uh, neutrality, for example, um, that, that have animated ASEAN. So it's really, in a, in a way, it's history catching up with, with where we want it to be. And that's why it's such a tremendously exciting moment for, for ASEAN. What ASEAN represents, uh, you know, is, is where the world is, is, is going. And at least from, from, from our perspective, when we look at it, if you look at uh, new organizations like BRICS and the SEO, these are uh, associations, these are multilateral arrangements that are far short of, of any kind of, um, you know, uh, bargain of, of, with, with sovereignty that the EU um, uh, represents uh, today. Yeah, they, they, they're not alliances. They're very, very deliberately eschew uh, uh, you know the kind of peacetime alliances that 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 the, the EU uh, or NATO and and the US uh, represent. And allow, allow me a follow up question because yeah. uh, you know the EU is is at least the way it was conceptualized or it is sold to the general public is that it's a way to solve this eternal European dilemma that the Europe kills <clears throat> itself right. We are at each other's throat every other decade, and we have been. And the question in Europe is not whether um, borders change. The question is whether they change um, with uh, with force, with violence, or not. And the EU was a way to to make that go away. And by now, it's 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 a it's failing. But the ASEAN is never went to each other's throat. You inherited borders that make no sense for the people who actually live there, but you ran with it. Everybody ran with it, and it's fine and it's and, and, and it works so um and connected to that seattle the south southeast uh the um treaty Asian organization treaty organized yeah failed <laughs> whereas in europe nato actually thrived and so on how can you explain that security was not a driving factor of trying of 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 asean trying to integrate more the way that europe tried to and first john and then we go to ulrike again so war is structural to Europe in a way that it's not in East Asia and particularly in Southeast Asia. Just historically, statistically, it wasn't resorted to in, 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 in the same way. You didn't have a lot of these tiny states, that were small, tiny by sometimes some Asian standards, right, that were always at each other's throats and, and reforming boundaries. Sovereignty also meant something different. It didn't have to, to you know, it didn't have to have uh, clear boundaries. As you know, these are pre-modern notions of, of sovereignty, some of them overlapping. Mm -hmm. There really was a time actually when Europe was more like that. And when, when Europe wasn't as structurally prone to war, it was the Middle Ages actually, in which it was extraordinarily peaceful compared to, um, you know, post-Napoleonic uh, Europe, right? So, so, you know, the EU arose with that as, as a solution to, to that endless war in that fashion. Um, but ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries never had that problem. It's not as if they didn't uh, have uh, wars of invasion at, at, at certain times, but it has an entirely different relationship to this war. And the, the their coming together did not have to be a kind of military alliance against some external enemy nor even against each other. Uh, it was really, you see, when ASEAN was formed in 1967, it was really after a period of tension between Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, you know, uh, and, 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 and Singapore was, was, was involved in that uh, kind of early, uh, early independent uh, Singapore uh, by, by extension. But they came together. So 
um, this, this, this is the, you know, this difference between um, East Asian international relations um, as, as fact, not as theory, and European international relations is very easy to miss. I mean, it's, it's very difficult to have uh, European or Western uh, thinkers understand this because they project. In fact, the entire field of international relations seems to be a projection of European historical experience, right? The theorization and universalization of it. It's very difficult for us to say, I mean, this is ridiculous. This is not how we experience interstate mm -hmm. Uh, relations, nor how we go about solving that that problem. This question of sovereignty of the people, this thing going back to the people, um, is again re really important. But in As ASEAN, the way they do this is by emphasizing the ASEAN of the people, the, the interactions between people, many of who, many of which cross borders. Some of these ethnicities and groups of, of people, as you know, they the the the, the boundaries don't don't work with them. You know, we have people, for example, who are maritime people, you know, sea gypsies, for example, who travel, which country do they belong to? Do they, they you know, are they, are they Malaysian, Indonesian? Uh, are they Singaporean? Um, some of these questions don't make entire sense in the Westphalian mode. And you have to come to some sort of, you know, you have to adapt, not, not always perfectly uh, and, and adjust to the presence of um, the, the very real presence of pre-Westphalian forms of, um, you know, political community and association. I don't know if that, that's, that, that's clear, but it does, you know, it's a different world in that sense. And, and the, the principles for a multipolar world, a kind of, while we're holding on to Westphalia, so to speak, being able to moderate it and to find other types of solidarity and association and cooperation across it are important. You know, Europeans might recognize it with the immense, if they look back to the immense complexity of, of the European Middle Ages. Yeah, often just derided mm -hmm. and dismissed as some sort of dark era. It was enormous political complexity and, 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 and interest. And by the way, that was when there was a kind of Europe. And now mm -hmm. you're trying to form a kind of dried up, desiccated oh. Europe, and it doesn't quite... Uh, you know, an intellectually, ideologically, uh, cosmologically desiccated Europe, it doesn't quite work. That, that's, I mean, uh, Pascal, thank you for bringing us together, but this is so interesting. And you, Mr. Pang, you should talk in German or French TV uh, every day, <laughs> basically telling us Europeans that we have a, a whatever, a Eurocentric notion of what sovereignty is, of what integration is, how we should fix the EU, why it does not work. It's a very intra-European, Euro-centric discussion. And I'm, I'm very happy that you basically sketched out that this is by any means, where do you, where do you come from in Asia for building the Asia cooperation system? We could make a little deviation and uh, think about the um, the underpinning of religion for these uh, different modus vivendi, yeah, because monotheistic reg religions probably brought Europe into this uh, killing each other nation sort of nationalism thing, whereas Buddhist and Hinduism obviously or apparently had another underpinning so that, as you described, there are states, but you never killed each other or there were not this sort of... Uh, what nation to nation war that um, that we had in Europe, yeah, and it's also interesting and right that we built after the Westphalian order, which was an order of balancing of power, balancing of power it was always balancing of power in the center in the 17th, 18th, 19th century. In the 20th century, what is the structural significant difference of the European the EU making is? that we tried to walk out of the system of balancing of power. We didn't want to balance power. We wanted to transfer power to the European Union. So it was a significant different logic to walk us out of balancing of power politics that we had about uh, over centuries to an institution making in the 20th century where we wanted to transcend power and to basically place it at the European level. And a hundred years after, we totally fall on our knees with this, yeah? So perhaps there is some wisdom in what you said, Mr. Punk, that Europe should reflect its own methods of balancing of power in the ages, in the in the centuries, uh, if, we are, we, if we want now to analyze why the European Union got it wrong in the last uh, 70 or 80 years. Now, because you were comparing 
Uh, and I agree. I think uh, Europe overstretched this aim of, say, state building sovereignty discourses, yeah, constitution making, and we couldn't work it out and, and we failed. And Asia never tried. Mercosur never tried. The Africans have a very interesting African Union now, but never tried to go the same path. So th that's why the EU is no longer a model. That I mean, that is what we just need to say. The EU wanted to be a role model and this is over, yeah? So we need to look for other models. And then for me, the interesting question is, um, what about the differences of say integration in the Asian world? You have in Asia, you have in the ASEAN, you have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have a very well-functioning economic cooperation system. You don't have a single currency. You are not messing up with citizen rights cross-border, yeah? but you managed pretty well your economic integration system beyond borders, yeah? And um, the real question now, if we want to compare passes of success and what, for instance, the BRICS countries, you mentioned the BRICS countries, what they are doing is really the question of what is the goal of these um, formations, let's call BRICS a formation of countries, where we don't know, do we know, where we don't know yet what they want to come up with. I mean, do they want to come up with a currency? Do they, you know, a, a, a gold standard currency? I mean, that's uh, why Turkey is buying gold now, as I heard, you know, I mean, everybody is uh, lining up for this sort of BRICS gold currency, gold standard currency. Do they want to have a system of trade? Do they want to have an inner BRICS trade system, which would be decoupled from the global trade system? I mean, there are many things you hear, and we will see in Kazan in sometime soon what they will come up with. But my question for you, Mr. Pang, is um, what is the model of integration? Let's stake this world, which was the world, the world of Europe. Yeah, Is there integration ambition in the BRICS world? And what would ASEAN do if there are, say, integration ambitions um, in the BRICS world, because if you do a currency, that's not trivial. Doing a currency is uh, another cup of tea than having uh, common markets. Indeed, indeed. And that's why I think there won't be a currency. There won't be a single currency, um, nor will there... You know, it's very interesting to ask me this at this point, because... Uh, uh, Malaysia has just applied to join uh, mm -hmm. BRICS, and uh, if if Malaysia is accepted, um, this will be the first um, ASEAN country um, in in BRICS, um, and and that perspective can be represented there. But I think my sense of it is that BRICS, like ASEAN, they, they, they are not they are not projects with a substantive sort of vision for how the world ought to be. They're not universal projects. They're not counter Europe. They're, they're not another Europe or not another America. Um, they are in many ways, I think, a reaction to the hegemonism of the uh, of unipolar hegemonism and a reaction to, uh, you know, they're, they're that. But they also, I think, um, they also represent the uh, impulse towards um, a, tr a true kind of international sovereign equality, a democracy of nations, so to speak, that's implicit in the promise of the of, of the UN um, Charter. Just this understanding and, and um, the maintenance of their diversity, of their political diversity, uh, because of course you have, what's the meaning of this, um, you know, democracy if, if you have a, a totally hierarchical system in which some are super sovereign and actually, some are very clearly not. So, so I don't think it 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 has a substantive pro is a substantive project in that sense. BRICS will be, you know, slippery and difficult to define, just as ASEAN is. But that's probably just the meaning of multipolarity, you know, which is all isn't always the best term for describing this, uh, you know, a, a kind of from another perspective, a fragmenting world order. But I want to stress that. You know, amidst these, as we as we observe uh, the world, the world is already in is is already multipolar, and all the talk now is about that divergence and decoupling and so on. 
but it's also extremely important. I think for, for this diversity to be maintained, we need to find, retrieve again, the cosmopolitanism, what, what is universal, what brings us together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's premature to for, for, for the West to come up with it, but that, that conversation needs to be had um, as well. Because that diversity depends on, on, on what you have in common. So if you look at Chinese foreign policy and their statements, they talk about it all the time. The shared shared destiny. One, you know, all of humanity, uh, you know, are, 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 kin, are kin. That we're all on one boat. We share a common destiny. And, and that should frame everything else, including our conflicts. How do we re retrieve that? Because we don't have to define this in... In, in liberal terms, even classical liberal terms, they're certainly not adequate uh, for, for, for East Asian experience or Southeast Asian experience. They don't work here anyway. Much as people might might pay lip service uh, to it, there's something else that, that brings people together. In each of these visions, each of these unipolar uh, sort of visions, there is a universalism, actually. It's just sometimes not legible to, 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 to the West. There is a universal a maintenance of our common humanity, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, there's there's also this point of what is possible and what yeah. is mm -hmm. what is ideal. And I think Europe yes. often gets caught in this ideal world where you think like yeah. tabula rasa and then we build the perfect society. Whereas the the ASEAN and, and other areas, they work with what they get <laughs> and then they do what you can without defining an endpoint, no teleological way of reasoning <laughs> backward from 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 an ultimate endpoint uh, Ulrike, can you please i mean first i would like to 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 say thank you yeah, because it's basically say european universalism which is also the leeway for this let's call it european arrogance or whatever we are the west we try to rule the world i mean that again as i said that was 20 years ago when you described everybody wants to model or copy the the european union yeah so i think there is a discussion about european universalism which uh which which we need to put into question on our continent, yeah, because there's no such thing than European con universalism, as you say. Uh, we need to think in in terms of humanities. It's interesting that all our faculties at uh, at universities uh, they they have humanities, yeah, what we've come, you know. So uh, it's already in 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 the wording. And um, and it cannot be only European concepts. I mean, as I said, yeah. I mean, what is the European notion of democracy? What's the European notion of the of sovereignty? Why are these notions not compatible with what you said about ASEAN? Because they have different underpinnings yeah. in terms of uh, religious or whatever. You know, Montesquieu, the Geist der Gesetze, yeah, where you come from, where you live. There's a different spirit of the laws. So. You cannot take the European words and place them on the world. And I think, unfortunately, that was the European ambition for long. But this is also what falls on our feet now that we are, I mean, Europe in a way to to to, to pardon Europe a little bit. Yeah, it's a stressful time. I mean, for 500 years, we were basically familiar or accustomed to being the center of the world, in a way, yeah, the European culture, mu music, whatever, technology, and then the political developments of the, you know, 500 years of colonialism and so on and so forth, yeah. And now we realize that we are shrinking, we are going down, the economies are, I looked at economic figures uh, recently, yeah, you see that most of the countries were, uh, in terms of uh, GDP per capita, output production, Europe is the only entity that is going down. The other countries on the world, including the US, yeah, they are keeping their level. So it's interesting to see how me living in Germany, I can nearly sense how this country is is going down. Yeah, you can see it in in transportation, in public services. Uh, you don't have the feeling that this can, and this is not only Germany. You go to France, to Paris, to Italy, to except Switzerland, but you travel in Europe, you can nearly feel that this is a continent that has, I wouldn't say no future, but that had a better future than it has. Yeah, mm -hmm. and if you have five hundred million citizens who are feeling. We will not have the future we had. Obviously, that impacts on the political mood. And then the mood becomes populist, resentment, whatever. Yeah. So in that sense, first, uh, I would say that uh, 
the, the, it's a hard time for Europeans because we need to go through this passerelle from a, a shiny past to a non-evident future. And we see other areas in the world like ASEAN, like China, like even Africa, yeah, where you have sparkling young people and the economy is, you know, happy, happy, going happy. Yeah. So uh, for Europe then to think about its role in the world is not a trivial exercise because if you are feeling a little bit depressive, I think I think Europe is in a depressive and say suicidal mood nearly. Yeah, with this war in Ukraine, Pascal, we need to talk about this. But uh, then the question is, yeah. we can no longer pretend to be universal. We can no longer pretend that we have the concepts for uh, modeling a multipolar world. And the interesting thing I think we need to discuss, you and me and the whole community who's doing this discussion in the next years, um, I think that the corona pandemic brought the world closer in some way. I mean, it was a same momentum at a time. Everybody had it. It was a it was an important sort of momentum that the whole world was doing this. Yeah. And it was it was a novel. Yeah. And we come out of that thing and we see that we have a coordination necessity, that we need to rule things. Be that NATO and what NATO does with the European Union, be it our wars, the wars in Gaza, the war in Ukraine, how is the world unfolding on these wars, be it WHO, the the, uh, the health organization and what it does to global citizens on vaccination passes and all these things. So we we see now that we have a different and a more urgent need for cooperation and for discussion on a global scale. I think for me, that's one of the uh, outcomes of, of the past two or three years. And then for me, the most important question is, do we do this discussion as nation states? Do, uh, do I talk here German to a Malaysian or do I talk European to an ASEAN? What is the level of sort of um, thinking where we try to... Uh, to shape a cosmopolitan world. You know, there's a huge academic discussion about global cosmopolitanism and global cosmopolitanism, uh, cosmopolitanism is uh, who's, the, who's the global sovereign? Are we global citizens? Is that a discussion we want to have? If so, are we in continental institutions, ASEAN, Europe, Africa, Mercosur? Are we going down to nation states? If we are going down to nation states, is it Seychellen, Seychellen and China? You know, I mean, what is a nation state? Yeah, uh, Fiji Islands in respect to the United States. I mean, what is a nation state? And and it's very interesting, Pascal, that this morning uh, the, uh, the there is the UN um, the UN gathering in in New York. Yeah, and the panel about the UN reform has been reopened. I remember that we did it 20 years ago. We wanted to reform the UN. It was impossible. But now they reopened a huge discussion about reorganizing the United Nations. And I think what we talk here feeds into this agenda. That's the one thing that currently nobody, neither China, Russia, the US, nor Malaysia, nobody questions that the UN is good <laughs> that we want UN rules. That's the one yeah. thing we kind of combine. But we are not we are not on the same page of what it should look like. But um, John, I would like you to re please react to anything from Ulrike. Uh, your thoughts, please. Um, I think it, you know it's a very good question. How do we um, engage? Um, we have to. I think a first pass at this answer is that at different levels all at the same time, so to speak. I've often looked at the issue of ASEAN, um, as I said, in, in this regional context, as a an accommodation of a nation-state system that we didn't invent, that we have to adapt into or was imposed on the region. In that way, Europe structured the political world for everybody else, right? 80% of the world was, was uh, colonialized and, and everyone had to have this nation state with a constitution, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now that we have this, there's also a tremendous historical trajectory that you don't know how to talk about at first, but in some way you have a sense about it. You said in Singapore, you know, you can sense things. Um, but so you need association and discussion at national level, nation to, people representing each other as nation, but also at, 
no, at, that, that, that is to say at a regional level, but also sub-regional. So within ASEAN, for example, there are these little groups. People, for example, in, uh, you know, southern Philippines, right, uh, and uh, North Borneo and Indonesia in that, in that part, they must have a discussion among themselves, you know, about what they have in common and how they sort out uh, issues uh, between them. Because they used to be an area. In fact, there used to be a sovereignties that ran across these areas. So they have to have discussion at that level. But a very important, and I think, interesting one that's opened up is this notion of civilizational dialogue. Now, that needs to be had. So I said below the nation state, but above the nation state. And I think the notion of civilizations, it's broad enough and vague enough, of course, but it does allow us to bring up notions, politically significant notions that are not just the nation state. These concepts that you talk about, about like the Respublica, the Bonum Commune, right? That are entirely actually legible from the Chinese perspective. We have our own terms for it, but, but this is very, very kind of uh, resonant. We need to be able to, to bring these into, into dialogue. And again, from the Islamic perspective, there is a, a dialogue to be had, I would maintain, between the Islamic world and China. From a Southeast Asian perspective, Islam as is understood in Southeast Asia and experienced Southeast Asia and China, without necessarily intruding Western concepts, so to speak, you know, yeah. Willy-nilly, it will be, it'll be structured by Western expectations, but let us get to these things in our own languages, in our conceptual vocabulary, and see what happens. So this is really important. Be, if I may, I want to go back to a time, and, and I think Dr. Guerrero puts it in the right context to talk about the issue of, of Europe, and all our issue, as being several centuries old. Let's look at a time when the dialogue between Europe and China was far better than it is today. In fact, I don't think that depth of dialogue has been approached since. Mm. And that is what happened during the Jesuit missions. This is almost 200 years and multi-generations of Jesuits writing back. This had a deep influence on Europe, on the Enlightenment and so on. And of course, a deep influence in, in China. But look at the openness with which they discussed each other's ideas. You don't have that openness today. As I, Europe I, has become uni universal in this thin liberal sense, it has become yeah. more provincial because it's more deluded, it's more pro preposterous and more isolated today than it has ever been in my lifetime. Thank you for the, saying this. And the, I am so yeah. sad about it. I, I am European and I am so sad about this, about the enclosure of Europe in its own theater. Thank you for saying it. Please continue. I mean, this yeah. is so, for so me. It's... That was at a time when there was greater parity. It's not that far back. There was a Europe, the, the Europe of the time of, of say, Matteo Ricci wasn't mm -hmm. superior. It, it, they didn't have that embedded sense of superiority in that sense. No. They had this sort of, yeah, they, they yeah. didn't. In <laughs> fact, they didn't have power superiority. They would get there and they would get their asses whipped if they tried, you know, the, the, the Portuguese couldn't uh, sort of go and invade China if they wanted. Um, so, and that was for a long time. They couldn't even do that in Southeast Asia. It's relatively recent. It's more of a 19th century phenomenon, this disparity. And the epistemology, so to speak, has followed that. So you actually look back to even the time of the, uh, you know, the, the European Enlightenment, which is really not that far back. And there was greater parity. So perhaps, you know, if we survive this, this period, there can be a European encounter if Europe retrieves itself uh, with, with China, for example. Or, or with Southeast I, Asia, I, I, there I, is I more on equal agree. terms. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Thing. I'm very sorry. Sorry, the interesting thing is China is trying to do that. The Silk Road, yeah, the new Silk Road, is that. the idea of let's reach Europe and yeah. and reconnect, and that is being yeah. talked about as a threat by the Euro by the yeah. Americans and the Europeans. Ulrike, can you? <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, I'm first thankful to John uh, to for saying this because for me as a European. Uh, Franco-German marriage, two kids in Paris, uh, multilingual. It's a sadness that Europe is basically perverting its own culture. Yeah, through this arrogance and through this uh, Überheblichkeit and this universalism and and whatever we came up with in the past, say, hundred years or eighty years, through the EU and how we got it wrong. We discussed this already. Yeah, 
So uh, I, I agree with you that the civilizatory, the civil, civilian civilizatory discourse on a global level must take place and we will need to find the fora for this. Yeah. And because what you were mentioning, that we had this um, uh, discussions earlier and better in the times than today. I mean, think of Immanuel Kant, the eternal peace. Basically, he's shaping a global republic. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there is a civilian component of peace in, 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 in the writings are of the 18th century. And I agree with you. And uh, I mean, Pascal, first, uh, this evening, I'm going to a China forum here in Berlin. Yeah? So I'm I'm doing this. I'm trying to do this contact with the Chinese because I see that they are they are uh, reaching out to us. They are they you know, they, they want us to engage with them. And that's why we talk Eurasia in this panel here. They want to reach out on a cultural level of resonance. And I can sense this. I can sense this when I'm speaking with Russian. I can sense this when I'm speaking with Chinese. I can sense it when I'm speaking with Iranians. Yeah, the Iranians are also listening like this. Where are the voices in Europe who want to reconnect because we had... Uh, good relations between Europe and Persians, you know, in the in the Middle Ages. And I agree that it was the monks, the monks. Yeah, I mean, the monks, the European monks and the Jesuit, not only the Jesuit, but essentially the monks when Europe was down yeah. after Roman Empire came down in the dark Middle Ages, uh, 10, 11, 12th century. And then it were the monks who brought Europe up yeah, through writing and uh, traveling and getting inspired by the Arabic cultures, by Persian cultures, Turkish and so on and so forth. Yeah? So I think we need to go back there. I think we need to skip our arrogance and universalism. And I think we need to find the fora for this, for um, engaging into a global discussion uh, on uh, how we can rebuild these levels of resonance. And I agree, these levels of resonance, they are in culture, they are in how to shape the social. It's not a discussion about liberalism. I think we are beyond the discussion about Liberal. I mean, there are discussions in, in in the US currently. I'm, you know, a little bit listening to these discussions. There's a very good magazine that's called uh, Cafe Americano. I can only recommend uh, to. It's an online Cafe Americano a, a magazine, and they are doing hardcore liberal liberalism, modern post liberal discussions. Yeah, theoretical discussions. Very good discussions. Yeah, and I think I think we need to uh, to engage. In, in global discussions about this, what is that? I mean, liberalism, what should it be? But more importantly, in my eyes, what is a community and where we find a community and where we have the cultural levels of resonance and how we then organize this in the notions of state and citizenship and, 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 yeah. I think that's the discussions we, we need to have. So I'm very happy that Pascal gave us the opportunity to, <laughs> to talk this through. Very happy to do Thank so. You. And, you know, uh, since they say ladies first, the flip side of that is gentlemen last. So, John, one minute for a last statement to react and then we need to wrap up. <laughs> I, I don't know if there's anything to 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 add to this. I think just just maybe recapping and looking back at this conversation now, I, um, you know, we were talk we were supposed to talk about ASEAN and 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 Europe, but we ended up talking about a deeper sort of problematic and and and, and challenge it, it's actually our problem all of us you know europe and southeast asia and it's important to find that it's important to be able to to identify that and to see that in russia as well and in china as well uh people are are trying to rethink this um and and you know as I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be in a discussion with such an intellectual uh, you know you a book for each of our main topics right you've written a book for for for, for every main um, point we, we we discussed I want to stress the importance of that discussion of, of discussion at, at, at that level that we don't just allow it to be just politics you know people look at say the formation of BRICS oh you know these people are ganging up against us. You have the typical brutal, brutalist imagination of international relations uh, imposed on it, or a merely economistic one. But I, I think it's it's a really exciting time to understand what the intellectual implications are, the political, philosophical uh, implications. 
um, you know, if if not for this conversation with Dr. Gero, I would be a little less sanguine about the prospects of that discussion. Um, e even as I talk like this sometimes, I'm just tarred and labeled as some sort of propagandist, you know, for this or that, uh, you know, dictator, or this autocracy, you know, for China. And this demonization, th this sort of thing really has to, you know, we have to find spaces where we people don't do this or the people who do this are just set aside at, at the very beginning, are just, are just told to just sit, sit down at, at the very beginning because it's just way too important for, for, for the discussion to be pushed off like that. And I note that it's extremely, um, you know, it's ironic that at a time when the greatest universalist claims are being made on behalf of Europe uh, and of the West right now, it is its most isolated, intellectually isolated, right? Most culturally isolated, unable to learn. In fact, dangerously so. And also economically, they're walling themselves out, you know, behind those high walls. Uh, they turn out to be in a very, very small yard. It's extremely dangerous. It's not good for, 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 for the rest of the world that this persists. Yeah. It's so sad. So, uh, Pascal, uh, I mean, I think we need to continue this discussion and have a second uh, round. Um, <laughs> I'm very happy also, Mr. Uh, um, Pang, that we didn't talk only in the criteria, in the normal criteria of multipolarity, which is the war yeah, and yeah. wars and, uh, you know, geo strategy and uh, who has which energy resources and so on and so forth. Yeah, because I think, uh, uh, interestingly, I mean, uh, remember, uh, um, Pascal wanted to talk about NATO and EU, uh, and, and we shifted. It, it's very interesting that intuitively we went away from this geostrategic sort of business and the BRICS and competition to different things. And I found this really, really um, inspiring. So I hope we can continue. I, I hope Me we too. We perhaps triggered other people to think in different terms and we can continue. Just one last sentence from me, because you talked about the little entities in Malaysia who also need to talk. Yeah. I remember you're sitting in Edinburgh. Yeah. And Edinburgh is Scotland. And Scotland is not the United Kingdom. Yeah. So you are sitting in a town who is redefining itself, yes. in Scotland and Barcelona. And Cat I will have a luncheon now with a person from Catalan, a European foundation from Catalan, but she is Barcelona and doesn't think in Spanish criteria. I just want to say that there also, there's a little niche of thought which we should pursue, sort of what is the identity uh, beyond the sort of nation state or below the nation state. Yeah. And we should definitely continue this discussion. We will continue this. And um, just also to be even more optimistic, the good news is about 25% of everybody who clicks on a video on my channel watches it to the end. And so if you are still watching, it means you're part of the discussion, you're part of the interested uh, group, and we can have that discussion. The need is there. Um, people watch and people discuss. And this is where we can connect. And this is how we fight the this machine that's being imposed from above. John Pang, uh, Ulrike Gero, thank you very much to, for today. Thank you. Uh...